when the Lord blesses us with a larger building, maybe we'll have space. Maybe I won't take up as much of it. How's that? John 19. John 19, as we will conclude this chapter today. Verses 28 to 42. The death of Jesus. Bow with me as I pray. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> as we open the sacred text, Lord, I think already you've been preparing our hearts and minds for what we are going to read about. We so eagerly want to get to Sunday morning, and we're going to get there. But before we do, there's that very dark day when the Lamb of God is finally slain. And with all of the corruption, with all of the sorrow, even that should be a reminder that you are carrying out your plan and it is good. I need your help, Lord, to preach your word faithfully so that you are pleased, but also that the body of Christ here at Grace Fellowship will be edified. Lord, that unbelievers will come to the recognition of their need for Jesus and that they would repent of their sins and trust him by faith. God, you can do all of these things. I know that I have brothers in the Lord elsewhere who are preaching before congregations today. God, give us all favor with your people. I pray that you would fill them as I ask that you fill me, and that we will be true, Lord, and that we will proclaim the truth. And we do this, that you will be glorified, and that we will worship you appropriately. God, thank you. Let you hear our prayers, because your Son has given us the access to your throne room. Now bless this time for your own namesake. Amen. How often do you question God with regard to something that you observe, read about, or hear about, and you can't put it all together, you can't fully understand it, you think about how these things could happen in a world that is supposedly governed by a sovereign and good creator? There's no supposedly to it. God is sovereign and he's good. I used to struggle especially in my younger years, in the view of suffering, in the view of pain, when I would see something on the news about a, a person on death row who had been on death row for 30 years and they would list the crimes that not only had they been found guilty of, but they would write or they would just tell you, yeah, I did them. And then you would turn on the television and see the St. Jude telethon for little kids who are getting cancer. And you're like, God? Oh, What's up with that? Well, I think as we consider today's text, we should be able to, to see at least a glimpse of how that is rightly answered. Because God is sovereign and God is eternally good. And he put his son on a cross. And even that is good. I don't understand all of those How's and wise, but it is good. And no matter what I see in the world, my own suffering or someone else's suffering, real suffering, with details that make no sense, if any at all, to me or you, when we look at the cross, we are looking at a truly innocent man being slaughtered in the place of sinners. Nothing can top that, folks. The sufferings of Job can't compare to that. And Job's sufferings were real. And I'm certainly not trying to minimize that or any suffering of your own. But we must come to this bedrock foundational issue that the Bible makes clear. God is good. That's it. Right there. He doesn't do something to be good. He's good. And he is worthy of our worship. Jesus, by this time on the cross, has been hanging there for some hours now. But we are approaching that 
three o'clock hour. We know that that's about the time that he died. So the subtitle is Jesus Dies. And first of all, I want to look at this. Jesus dies as the satisfactory sacrifice. For those theologians in the crowd, you'll be familiar with the word propitiation. You see, you can offer a sacrifice and it be rejected. God gives very specific standards about what kind of sacrifice you are to offer. When you read the book of Malachi, you will find that the priests are offering insufficient sacrifices and God is judging them for it. We need a sacrifice that is perfect. We need a sacrifice, a one-time-for-all-time sacrifice. In fact, in the book of Hebrews, that book has just become so near and dear to me over the past four or five years, You'll read there in the book of Hebrews, there's a phrase, he died one time for all. And that doesn't mean all people, that means one time for all time. You don't have to come back and repeat this. Why? Because the, satis because the sacrifice was complete and accepted. So, so rich. So Jesus is the satisfactory sacrifice. Look at verses 28 through 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. By the way, he would not be that much higher than them. He's lifted up, but it's, it's not like they're way, way up high. It's verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, <laughs> it's one word in Greek, telastai. <laughs> It is finished. It's complete. It's done. <laughs> and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Wasn't taken from him. He gave it up. In verses 28 and 29, Jesus, knowing that all was now accomplished. Now all is finished. Now what does that mean? Because he still has to die. Some people want to make this argument that, well, that was enough. No, no. But from the cross, he is able to, to know and, and keep this in mind. He is fully God, but he also became fully man. And in his humanity, he studied the scriptures. He grew in wisdom and stature. And he is so acquainted with the scriptures that he wrote, I mean, ultimately, that he is able to look out from Calvary. And to say, I didn't get here a minute too soon. I didn't forget something on a list. And I need to come down from here so I can go do that. He is able, in that moment, to know, other than his death, which is about to happen. Father, I've done it. That which you sent me to do, I have accomplished. How rich is that, folks? Are you not glad that God didn't say, well, my son did his part, now you do yours? And that doesn't mean that we, we teach that you just, you know, say a prayer and then live as you please. No, now you're actually empowered and, and enabled to live as you should. But the point is, with regard to the sacrifice, none of us could make it. I mean, the Levitical high priest couldn't make a sufficient sacrifice. That's why they had to keep repeating them. But this one is different. The greatest high priest of the greatest priesthood, not offering the blood of bulls and goats, but the blood of himself, the spotless, unblemished lamb of God, gives his life and God accepts it. That sacrifice, my friend, is why you, and it's why I, and it's why any who will repent and believe have any hope at all. Had Jesus not done it, we would have absolutely no hope. Knowing this, and he says, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. It looks to be that the fulfillment there is actually referring back to Psalm 69, which is largely messianic. In verse 21, written by David, talking about how he would thirst. But this is where I think John is going. 
think John is doing something here, and I'm, I'm, I'm always going to keep John 20, 31 in mind when John says, here's the reason why I'm writing all of this down, so that you will know who Jesus is, so that you will believe him, and you will have life in him. Snapshots of divinity, that's how I've titled this whole study, and I know some of you say, yeah, there, you've told us that a few times. Well, if your mind and memory is like that of my own, then you need reminding. What is John accomplishing in this account? It's, it's not that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are trying to accomplish just completely different things, but they all have their particular angles. And John is saying, I am trying to show you that Jesus is God. And at the same time, I am trying to show you that he is fully man. And that's going to come into play in a little bit, but I'll, I'll hold off on that. Jesus began his public ministry in a garden, in a well, rather a wilderness, and he was hungry. And now as he is completing it, he is thirsty. And he says it loud enough to be heard, I thirst. In verse 30, sour wine was lifted up to him. Now, people get into these little arguments that would, Daryl, do you think that's real wine or was it grape juice? It's real wine. And I had a gentleman, and I love him, and I grew up um, there in Saudi, and he said, no, if alcohol touches your tongue, it's a sin. And I went, I disagree with you biblically, and I don't even drink, so it's not like I'm trying to promote this. Uh, well, there's a guy who wrote a book. He's a Southern Baptist. Yeah, I read it. Wasn't very good. So that's not a promotion of drinking. But this is wine. It's what they had. He takes it. It's lifted up to him. And then he says that, that one word, tell us that. It is finished. And he bows his head and he gives up his spirit. The it is finished phrase is referring to the work that Jesus came to definitely accomplish, not possibly accomplish, but fully accomplish. All of his obligations had been met. There was nothing more to do. Remember back in the Sermon on the Mount, early in his public ministry, Matthew 5, he says, I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And that's what he is able to say, I've done it. The law that, that looks at all of you and looks at me and says, you'll never measure up. You'll never be enough. You'll never do enough. I was never given to save you. Paul says in Galatians 3, 3.19, anticipating a question. Well, then if the law can't save us, why did God give it? I'll tell you why he gave it. Two primary reasons. It will expose your sin, not your righteousness. And when you feel the weight of that sin and the utter hopelessness of your, of your condition, you will bow your head and say, then that's it, I'm done. I've got nothing to hope for. And then the law says, look up. Look up. The Lamb of God, He fulfilled me on your behalf. Rejoice, O ruined sinner, because the Savior has come. And he didn't just show up. He had work to do, and he did it, and it is finished. Isn't that good, y'all? Doesn't that make your heart rejoice? If that makes you go, Whoa, now I can just go live any old way I please, then you missed it. You need to get saved or wake up or something. I don't. <laughs> but the, the truth is, when you take that in, you realize that God did that on your behalf. If that doesn't motivate you to want to walk in holiness, I don't know anything that will. Jesus is looking at his father, but it's as if he could have an eye on his people and say, I've done this for you. I've done it for you. It's time for me to die now. And he gives up his spirit. No man took it from him. God gave it. He carried out the will of God. To my fellow believers, no, I'm not done yet. I know I always do that at the end. I've got more to go. But you and only you and I, those who have believed, we 
are to rejoice that Jesus died on that cross as the sufficient sacrifice in our place. You know, Paul says in Acts 17, verse 3, that Jesus died according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament said that the Messiah would come, but it also said that He would die. See, it says more than that, right? Oh, it does. I'll let you in on the secret. We don't even have to wait next Sunday. It also says that He will live, and He does. But we got to deal with this. But fellow brothers and sisters, let us rejoice in God who rescued us. And let us, let us offer our worship to Him with that as our heartbeat. We're not coming in here in this building or any other building with any other congregation and singing, Oh God, I, I'm so glad you're accepting my works and, and the things I've done. No! Oh God, I'm but a sinner. If it were not for your Son, I would be hopeless and rightly condemned. But because of your Son, I am now yours and you are mine. Rejoice. Jesus dies, second of all, from verses 31 to 37, as the only one who is the viable candidate as Messiah. There have been plenty of people by this time who have claimed to be the Messiah. Jesus also has made this claim, but he is distinct. Why? Because he is the Messiah, and the claim of Messiahship has, it's undeniable that it's all coming together in Jesus. I remind you of Luke 24, 27, where Jesus, after his resurrection, said that all of the Old Testament was talking about me. All of it. So let's look at verses 31 to 37. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. There we go. There's that theme. Verse 36. For these things took place that the Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another Scripture says, they will look on him they have pierced. So in verse 31, we are finding out that this is a preparation day, but not preparation for the Passover. No, this is preparation for the Sabbath. It's Friday at this time. I know some will argue, no, it's, it's not Friday, but it is. It's also called a high Sabbath, which is talking about how it is coinciding with Passover week. You have these feasts in Israel. And, and when they have these feasts, when the Sabbath occurs, that's called a high Sabbath day. That's what that means. Now, the Jews had asked Pilate to have the, the legs of these three crucified men broken. Why? Because they need death to be expedient. We are approaching Sabbath. We can't leave their bodies on a tree, as Deuteronomy tells us. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. You don't leave them on a tree overnight. And they're still lingering. And remember, the way you die uh, via crucifixion is that you suffocate and, and you're able to, to hold up your body weight until finally you have no more strength and then, and then it doesn't take long from there. Well, the Romans would come and they would use an iron mallet. It's a horrible description. And they would break your legs. We know archaeologically they have found skeletons where you find that they've been crucified and their legs are shattered. And so they do that. You've got the man on his left, the man on his right. The Jews certainly don't want to break God's law. <laughs> that's, that's the sad irony in all of this. They're trying to keep their we keep the law mindset even though they are just sinning left and right. In verses 32 through 34, the soldiers, after receiving the orders, even though that's not written in, we know that that would have to come. Pilate would be the one signing off on this. 
They begin the process of breaking the legs. They, as I said, broke the one on his right and on his left, but by the time they reach Jesus, they find he's dead. There's no point in breaking his legs. And that's just circumstance, right? Just so happened to be that way. Or is there something more? Yeah, there's something more. One of the soldiers pierces Jesus' side with a spear and blood and water comes out. Now, I want to touch on this. Uh, when I do my sermon research, I have to do a lot of reading and sometimes, 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 that's, you know, like, oh, this is, this is something. But, but some have made more of this than I think they should, and certainly more than what you find in the text. One of the commentators that I consistently go to is Dr. D.A. Carson. He is so reputable, such a good scholar, and he's, he's a scholar of, of so much. I mean, he knows Jewish history, church history. I mean, he may have known Moses personally, I don't know, but he's just a rich theologian. And here's what he says concerning this idea that the blood and water symbolize something else. He says, that it wasn't until John Chrysostom, now you're saying, who's that guy? I remember in uh, a history class there, my first year of seminary, uh, he said, he's called this, a little old man in history, he's called the golden mouthed, or the golden tongue. That's how he said it too. Um, he, that man may still be alive, he'd be 150. But, but Chrysostom was just incredible, so eloquent. And, and I, I believe a follower of Jesus. And he's considered a church father to some degree. But not until the fourth century does he come up with this. Polycarp doesn't come up with this. None of these other guys come up with this. And here's what he did. He suggested that the water represents baptism and the blood represents the Lord's table or communion. And he suggested it. And people run with it. Well, hey, one of the church fathers came up with this, but not all. And he only suggested it. He's supposing that this could be some symbolic. But let's go with what we know from the text. Here's what we know. By the time John writes this account, there's a movement called docetism. It's called the docetics. The docetics had no problem recognizing the deity of Jesus, but they would not recognize the humanity of Jesus. That's an illusion. What is John doing here? Think about all of the ways he's describing this event. I thirst. When's the last time he said, you know, the other day I, I had a dream and it was thirsty. What, you were thirsty in the dream? No, my, my dream was thirsty. The other day I had a whim and, and it, it, it got hungry. No, that's goofy. Jesus is not a metaphor or a symbol. Those things don't get thirsty. Humans get thirsty. And that's what John is doing, folks. And I'll say that going all the way, I mean, John 20, 31, over and over and over, and even here in this text, so that you may believe. I'm trying to tell you who Jesus is in his nature. Fully God, eternally God, but became a man, and he's now fully God, fully man, and that's the way it is. And the docetics would say, no, no, no. -uh. God, but not man. And John says, well, let me tell you something. I stood there and watched him die. I heard him say, I thirst. I touched him. I saw him. I heard him. Ideas don't bleed. Symbols don't bleed. People do. And that's what he did. That spear went into him and blood and water came out. And you can try to make that what you want to make it. But here's what John says. He's real. And he's human. And he is divine. God the Son died on that cross for us. That's what the text is pointing to. That has to be sufficient. Verses 35 to 37 are going to hammer that point down even more. John is referring to Jesus' human nature. Jesus died. John says, I'm an eyewitness of this event. And I'm telling you about it so that you may believe. You're not believing in a hope created by people you're not you are not believing in an idea that we came up with you are believing in that which is bedrock absolute jesus is god this is man 
And that's why I'm telling you these things. And he goes on to point to Jesus' full humanity by referring to the fulfillment of two Old Testament passages. This first one, not one of his bones will be broken. What is that referring to? Well, in the bigger picture, Exodus 12, 46, when the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, and they're going to observe what? That first Passover, right? And God has given, uh, this is what you're going to do. You've got to have a lamb. And these are the, the criteria. He's very specific on this. And one of the criteria is no broken bones. And you think, why did God say that to Moses back in Exodus 12? Because God knew in Exodus 12 what he also knew in John 19. I know what I'm doing. The Passover lamb will have no broken bones. And the day is going to come when the ultimate Passover lamb will have no broken bones. They didn't break his legs. Had they broken his legs, then crossed Jesus off as a viable candidate to be Messiah. But that didn't happen. And it wasn't by chance. It's by design. Sovereign God carrying all of this out. David is actually where you read not a bone will be broken. It's going back to Exodus 12, but that's the actual quote where in, in Exodus 12, God is saying the Passover lamb will have no broken bones. Psalm 34, 20 says, not a bone of mine is broken. But then there's another one. Zechariah 12, 10, speaking of Messiah. Here's what he wrote. They will look on him, Messiah, whom they have pierced. So that Roman soldier just on a whim said, hey, let me just stab him. Because I'm bored. No! That Roman soldier, just like the ones earlier who divided his, his garments, not having a clue as to what that was really doing, well, the same thing is going on here. He pierces Jesus and doesn't break a bone. Blood and water come out, which signifies death. And that's it. It really is it. Zechariah said, you will look on him whom you pierce. Folks, the other two men had their legs broken and no need for piercing. Jesus didn't have his legs broken, but they pierced him. Why? Because what God had been saying from centuries before, that's why. That is the richness of knowing that God's word is reliable. God's word is trustworthy, folks. Don't you dare be one of those people who say, well, I think some of it is. Well, then which parts aren't? And, and, and how'd you come to that conclusion? Rejoice that God has spoken and made sure that it has been written down and preserved. It's always true. And put your confidence in Him and commune with Him in His Word often. Third and finally, Jesus dies to be buried Verses 38 to 42, and before you say, well, duh. Here's what usually happened with crucified people. And I'm, I'm really not trying to make anyone sick, and I know there are little ones in the room, but I want to say this anyway. This is what usually happened. Crucifixion was so shameful that most often family members wouldn't come because of the disgrace. And the bodies were left there by the Romans. And you can imagine what animals do. They're not buried, folks. They would finally take down the remaining carcass and simply throw it over the side. No burial. But why is it different for Jesus? Well, circumstances just turned out well. No, no, no. He died to be buried. You do not bury symbols. You do not bury metaphors. You do not bury ideas, though figuratively you can, but literally you can't. You literally bury people. Hopefully they are deceased when you bury them. If not, we will turn you into the authorities. But you bury the deceased. In verse 38, look at this. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, 
who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So in verse 38, we read about this man named Joseph of Arimathea. He is mentioned in all four gospel accounts, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and here in John 19. But in Mark 15 and Luke 23, we find that he is a prominent member of the council or the Sanhedrin. But apparently he had no part in the trials of Jesus. Up to this point, Joseph has been a secret disciple of Jesus. But what this did took the secrecy away because this is going to be a very public thing in order to have the body removed you know that you've had to seek Pilate's permission so when Joseph of Arimathea comes along to do that the Jews who are still going to be near are going to be like what are you doing and now Joseph is going to have to say I'm getting my Lord off of this cross secrecy is no more you do with me whatever you will, but I'm his. I'm his follower. In Matthew 27, 57, we find that Joseph was a rich man. And that corresponds to Isaiah 53, verse 9, wherein Isaiah writes this about the Messiah. And they made his grave with the wicked. Who did he get crucified beside? Or in the middle of? Two wicked men. One came to know the Lord. And with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Even this is fulfillment of what was said in the Old Testament. None of this is happenstance. In Matthew 27, 60, we find that the tomb that Jesus was placed in belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. The tomb was nearby and they needed to bury him rather quickly due to the coming Sabbath. I'm going to come back to Pilate for a moment, the Roman governor who had handed Jesus over to be crucified. And this is very significant because there is no way that Pilate would have allowed Jesus' body to be removed from that cross if he were still alive. That did not happen, folks. You didn't bring him down and death. Pilate would not sign off any other way. When they are able to report to Pilate, and it would have been the Romans doing so, he's dead. The one on the middle, on the middle cross, he's dead. No, it's no doubt about it. He's dead. Here's, here's how we know him. He, he wasn't breathing. We didn't have to break his legs. We pierced his side. Blood and water came out. He's, oh, then he, yeah, he's dead. So Pilate says, okay, you may have his body. He allows Joseph to have the body of Jesus and to do preparations to take it away for burial. In verse 39, Nicodemus, who we read about back in John chapter 3, when Jesus was telling him about the new birth, he shows up. He too was secretive about following Jesus until now. See, that's what's happening, folks. It has taken the death of Jesus for these men who were secretive in their allegiance to him. And I don't think in John 3, Nicodemus was, was a believer, but I think, you know, he's, he's coming to realize who Jesus is. I think by this time, he is a believer. You said, Daryl, you're reading that into the text. And, and I, I certainly don't want to be guilty of that. I'm simply looking at, he didn't have to do any of these things, but he does them at great cost to his own, to his own name. And he brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes, which is part of the spice combination that you would bring to show your love and devotion for the decedent. And a lot of it. Joseph, or Nicodemus was a wealthy man and he brought a lot of spice. And he's not doing it in, in hiding anymore. In verse 40, they wrapped Jesus' body in linen wrappings with spices for his burial. Yet another piece of evidence that Jesus was truly dead because he had truly been human. 
Folks, I want to say this before I get to verses 41 and 42. Some people have, have failed to understand what is called the high union, where in one person there are two natures, the divine and the human. And throughout the ages, you've, you've had Arianism, you've had monophysticism, Nestorianism, all of these deviations, aberrant views of, of, the, of the nature of, of God, the nature of Jesus. But Jesus, in his deity, did not die. God does not die. But in his humanity, he dies. So he wasn't God when he died. No, he's fully God and fully man. But even in death, he is sovereignly ruling and reigning. When he was in Mary's belly, he is sovereignly ruling and reigning because he's God. But in his humanity, he's a little baby who has to have his diaper changed and has to learn how to you know, walk and talk and learn how to read. If you don't get that down, you're going to struggle. Cults are more than willing to say, hey, come join us. We hold these weird views. But he's fully God and fully man. In his deity, no, he did not die. But in his humanity, he did. Well, whether it be in the womb or in the tomb, Jesus as God rules and reigns. That's good stuff. Verses 41 and 42, we find that Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a tomb in which no one else had been placed there for burial. And so you don't worry about overcrowding. He wouldn't be there long. That tomb was just for a little while. And it would be vacated, not because his body would be removed, but as we will read next week, because he will come out of the tomb alive. Mark 15 tells us that they placed a stone at the entrance of the tomb, and we know that some of the other details are these. The Jews talked about how Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead, so lest his disciples come and steal the body, let's seal it up. Rome, give us permission, and, and they did. Pilate says, do what you need to do. Secure it. A Roman guard is there. Jesus is in that tomb, folks, a dead man, secured in there. Nobody's going to get him out. Well, maybe not... Nobody. We'll come back to that. Know for certain that Jesus was truly human. And at his death, he was really buried. And God had been pointing to that day from centuries before. The word of God is reliable. Amen. Amen. To my family and Jesus, we have overwhelming proof that God's word is reliable. Therefore, we should have overwhelming confidence that God's word is perfectly reliable and perfectly sufficient. The people living in what we know of as Old Testament times trusted that God would keep his word concerning sending the Messiah. Well, certain ones who were alive when Messiah showed up, they witnessed his life, they witnessed his death and his burial, and they wrote those details down for their generation and the generations to follow so that we could read about this so that we would be become convinced that we would become convinced that Jesus is God and he is the only one who can save sinners. Luke said early in his account, not in Acts, but in the Gospel of Luke, I've written these things down in most consecutive order so that you will have confidence that what you have believed is believable. I'm paraphrasing that. But he's saying, I want you to have confidence that the things you have read in the scriptures are true. We don't hope that they're true. We can know that they are true, even when we don't fully understand them. Just because Daryl reads a passage and he goes, oh, I don't get this, and that didn't make sense to me. I mean, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but there's been times when I've been like that, and there's still times where I'm like, I don't know what's going on here. But here's what I can step away and, and say. It's true whether I get it or not. It's true, always has been, always will be. And if that isn't enough, I don't know what is. Are we allowed to have questions? Of course we are. But if we, if we think that we have to be able to figure out everything, then, then we're, we're going to be a mess. 
We're going to be a mess. We have to simply come to this trust that God wrote it down so that we could know who he is, that we would believe him. Jesus of Nazareth is eternally God who became a man while remaining fully God, and he truly died. They buried a dead man, but thankfully Sunday morning is coming, and we'll read about that, Lord willing, next Sunday. I would encourage you to read about it today and tomorrow and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday, and the days following. Keep coming back to John 20 a whole lot. Keep going to Matthew 28 a whole lot. Keep going to 1 Corinthians 15 a whole lot. Why? Because a tomb was vacated by the Son of God who stepped out of it alive and well, never more to die. Mm -hmm. Unbeliever, you might be sitting there saying, these people are nuts. This is mythology. This is some fanciful story of some person's own creation. I wonder who influenced you on thinking that way. And before you say, well, Darrell, you only believe what you believe because you grew up in a home where that was taught. Oh, no. no I've been very open about a time in my life when I had what I would call somewhat of a crisis of faith where I, it wasn't that I didn't believe that there was a God, but I was really wondering, why do I believe what I say I believe? So I began to search, and I began to study. And the more I studied, the more I found, man, these things are absolutely true. Not because I want them to be, I do, but that's not why I believe them to be true. I'm convinced that they are true. So unbeliever, someone has influenced you. I simply tell you and charge you to listen to the God who has made himself known. Take up his revelation, the specific revelation known as the Bible, because it will tell you that God in Genesis 3.15 made a promise to send, us, to send a Messiah because sin had just entered into the world and it shattered all of us. And we needed a sin bearer. And his son is that sin bearer. And he came into a real world as a real man, but retaining full godhood. And he didn't just show up to be here. He showed up to do a work that his father had given him to do. And that's why what we read today is so meaningful. When from the cross, looking out, he says, knowing that all of it is accomplished, says, it is finished. And you need him. There's not a thing that Daryl Winters can do for you. Daryl, will you speak for me? Uh, when you go before God, it won't do you a bit of good. There's only one who can be your advocate. There's only one who's truly righteous. And there's only one who absorbed the debt that you owed. It is, his name is Jesus. And this, the beautiful part of the story is, is he says, come to me. I won't cast you out. Come to me. But I'm a pretty bad sinner. Ah, we all are. I, I'm telling you, man, I, I've, I've, divin into the, I've, I've dove, I, I, I went into the pool really deep. Yeah. And he can rescue you. Turn from your sins and trust in this Jesus and he will rescue you. <laughs> and that's not mythology. That's absolute truth. Would you bow with me? Father, as we close this message from this text i pray that it will be rich to our hearts and minds not not daryl's words but the text itself oh god may we be brought to a greater sense of of who you are that we may respond great uh with with, with a greater sense of 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 your awesomeness and and your incredible nature and that we would worship you as we get ready to sing, Lord, I pray that we will not simply recite the words that are written down, but we will offer to you a song of praise from hearts that have been redeemed by the Lamb of God who lived and who did die and who was buried, but as we also know, came out of the tomb alive and well. Amen.